Welcome back to our study of the book of the Apocalypse. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. Saint John the Apostle, pray for us. And Saint Joan of Arc, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So welcome back. We have just finished chapter 17. Last time we're going to continue on with chapter 18 of the book of the Apocalypse. As we go on, we're now getting to the better part because here we have the victory of God, the destruction of the harlot, the whore of Babylon is going to be taken out in this chapter. And we're going to go on to the victory of the Word, the Lord God Almighty. So let's go ahead and delve right into it. Okay, Start with chapter 18. And just seeing where we are. In the uh, apocalypse here, we have this chiasm, and we are now at this last portion here. The seven angels, the horror of Babylon, the new Jerusalem. So that will be coming up. Okay, We saw this is mirrored by the seven epistles earlier on. And so we'll pick up there. So last time we saw the whore of Babylon and uh, that unhappy character, uh, she was riding that beast. Uh, she was uh, clothed in scarlet and purple. And I want to make a comment on, there are some people who left some comments about the scarlet and the purple and what this represents and how this is actually not the liturgical colors of the Catholic Church, even though we do use those two colors, but most of the colors we use are white, green, and well, as well as the other colors. But these uh, colors of scarlet actually show up in sacred scripture, in, in uh, Isaiah. So let's take a look at that. So remember that the, uh, the woman was clothed with purple and scarlet. She was gilt with gold, precious stones. But we see that in Josephus, our unwitting friend Josephus, the Jew who was a general in the wars, during the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, he mentions that there were taken out of Jerusalem gold, precious stones, the treasure of the temple handed over to Titus, who was laying siege to Jerusalem, uh, the coats with a great quantity of purple and scarlet. Notice those two colors in there. Common colors of the high priests in the Old Covenant. So this does have a connection to the temple. It does have a connection to Jerusalem. Now, going on to chapter 18, we're going to talk about the fall of Babylon. So in the fall of Babylon, we see a number of things happen. There's a number of references back to Jeremiah, back to the Babylonian captivity, and back to the destruction of the temple in the Old Covenant, and how it's going to be mirrored with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, and why the temple destruction has something very important to do with how it is mirrored in the New Covenant. So we'll take a look at that. So we recall that during the Babylonian captivity, uh, Daniel the prophet uh, foretold the destruction of Babylon. This is where the, the handwriting was seen on the wall, that, that hand uh, that you see here, appeared and wrote these letters that the, king, the kingdom of Babylon has been measured, been found wanting, and will be divided, will be destroyed. So Babylon will be destroyed. This is what was predicted in uh, Daniel, and indeed it, it happened very soon thereafter. But what does the fall of Babylon mean in the New Covenant? What does it matter that Babylon was destroyed back in the old? Why are we concerned about it? Why is St. John concerned about it now in chapter 17 and 18 of the Apocalypse? Let's take a look. What is this Babylon? What does the fall of Babylon really mean? So the fall of Babylon. You've got to keep in mind a principle. We saw this principle before. That mysterious or unusual verses in the New Testament are illuminated by parallel ones in the old. 
So when we're seeing these references to Babylon has fallen, what does that mean? Well, let's take a look then. If we have something that's very mysterious, we, we just don't get it. In fact, St. Paul even said it was a mystery back in chapter 17. We should go and illuminate those verses with Old Testament verses. It's a good principle to keep in mind, and it's one we're going to follow as we look at the fall of Babylon. So the fall of Babylon was spoken of by Jeremiah, and it's also spoken of here in the Apocalypse. Let's look at the similarities that exist here between this uh, fall of Babylon, spoken of by Jeremiah, when Babylon actually existed and was a kingdom and a uh, strong kingdom in the time of the Old Covenant and the time of the Apocalypse and how that relates. So, we see that in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 37, Babylon shall be reduced to heaps and shall become a dwelling place for dragons. Well, we see in the Apocalypse that Babylon is become the habitation of devils, of every unclean spirit. And there's the correlation between the devils and the dragons. Then we see in Jeremiah, chapter 51, verse 7, that Babylon made all the earth drunk. The nations have drunk of her wine. In the Apocalypse, we also see that all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And that's referencing Babylon and the whore of Babylon. Jeremiah 51 again. People are exhorted to flee ye from the midst of Babylon and let everyone save his own life. We also see a similar exhortation. Go out from her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins in the apocalypse. And then, we, speaking of this go out and flee, in Josephus' wars, again, our, our unwitting friend Josephus, the, the Jew who writes things that confirm what's taking place in the Babylon, in the destruction of Jerusalem, says that the priests heard a sound as of a multitude, these multitude of voices saying, let us depart hence. Right? Go out from her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. And Josephus said they actually heard those words, let us depart, go out, flee from this place. So these are some of the similarities. There's a few more we're going to go through. We're laying out some similarities between Babylon in the Old Covenant and uh, Babylon as referenced in chapter 18 and the fall of Babylon. Babylon, that great city, has fallen. We're going to see that show up. Let's take a look back at some of these similarities again. In Jeremiah, it says that Babylon's judgment has reached even to the heavens. Well, we see the same in the Apocalypse, that Babylon, her, her sins have reached unto heaven. We see that God is going to pay her according to her work, according to all that she hath done, do ye to her. She'll be punished according to her works. And so also we see this in the book of the Apocalypse. Render to her as she also hath rendered to you according to her works. Then it says that her dwelling places are burnt. In Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 30. And then in the Apocalypse chapter 18 verse 8. She shall be burnt with the fire. A few more comparisons. The heavens and the earth and all that are in them shall give praise for Babylon, for the spoilers have come to her. Sometimes you'll see that rendered, this passage rendered, that the heavens and the earth shall uh, give praise, shall rejoice over Babylon, that is, uh, over her destruction, rejoice over her destruction. So that's sometimes a, a variant translation you'll see. And you'll see why that's important as we look back at the Apocalypse. In the Apocalypse, we see, Rejoice thou over her, uh, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath judged your judgment on her. And finally, Jeremiah chap uh, chapter 51, verse 49, As Babylon caused that there should fall slain in, in Israel, so of Babylon there shall fall slain in all the earth. And then we see in Apocalypse chapter 18, verse 24, In her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So we're seeing a number of similarities and in, in comparisons between the destruction of Babylon, the fall of Babylon, as it was written of in 
Jeremiah, but also as St. John echoes these same things, parallel things. We just pointed out eight of them, how there are parallels. We're going to see just a couple more, and we'll see why there are these parallels. And by the way, if you have questions, you can submit those on our Facebook page. I'm not a super big fan of Facebook at all, but uh, it's, a, it's a platform we can, we can get uh, receive questions on, and then also on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, since it's Fidelium, you can uh, submit some questions there, and we'll pick those up uh, later on at the end of the class. So let's get back to the Apocalypse, chapter 18, verse 24. And focus in on this verse. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. We'll remember what our Lord said in, of, of Jerusalem. I send you prophets and wise men. Some you will put to death, some you will persecute, that upon you may come all the just blood that hath been shed upon the earth. Can you see the parallels in those two passages? Remember, the first passage is referring to Babylon. In her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And here in Matthew 23, our Lord is speaking of Jerusalem, not Babylon. He's speaking of Jerusalem. He says, I send you prophets, wise men, saints, you could say. Some you'll put to death, you'll persecute. That upon you may come all the just blood, the blood of the saints, that hath been shed upon the earth. How similar those passages are, huh? I think our, our blessed Lord is trying to make a connection there because when we connect these two passages, we realize this Babylon is actually a reference to Jerusalem. It's just a little bit more confirmation of how Babylon is Jerusalem, okay? It's not as the anti-Catholic... If you have not looked at the coverage of the Whore of Babylon, chapter 17, take a look at the last video we made on that and go through it carefully. Uh, because I noticed some of the comments that people left seemed like they hadn't seen the video. Some people are still arguing that maybe it's the Catholic Church. Take a look at the video very closely, very carefully, and you, you'll see that the Whore of Babylon is not the Catholic Church. It is a reference to Jerusalem. So in her, in uh, Jerusalem, uh, was found the you know, the prophets, and in Babylon likewise. So what's the point of all these references back to Babylon, to Jeremiah, where in the time of Babylon, as St. John is alluding to, making these connections back to Jeremiah, in the fall of Babylon, and then St. John is picking up that same imagery in uh, eight points, and then our Lord makes another point that connects Babylon to Jerusalem. What is the point of all this? The point is this. The major thing that Babylon did was destroy the temple. However, Jerusalem did something worse. Jerusalem didn't destroy the temple, that is the physical temple, but they destroyed the temple of the body of our Lord. Remember our Lord said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Behind me is an image of the Old Covenant temple. That's what Babylon destroyed during the Babylonian captivity. And all those references back to Babylon and her judgment, her judgment, Babylon's judgment, was because she destroyed the first temple, Solomon's temple. That was the judgment because that's what Babylon was being punished for. What is Jerusalem's judgment? She destroyed the temple of the body of our Lord. And that's a worse judgment. But you notice the parallels. That's because God is setting up that, that parallel image so that we can understand that they have done away with the true temple. And then, of course, God says, well, and I'm going to take away your physical temple as well. And he had the Romans then come in and destroy the temple in 70 A.D. There's other imagery, however, that we see in chapter 18, not only of Babylon, that mighty city that is being destroyed, but we see other imagery. We see the imagery of Exodus. It should be no surprise to you. There's a lot of Exodus imagery in the Apocalypse. Let's take a look at some of that, shall we? The Exodus imagery, 
is that the city is also called Egypt. We saw that back in the Apocalypse chapter 11, verse 8. The people are told to go out from her. And remember, of course, in the Exodus, that was the whole point. They were going out from Egypt to the Promised Land. They were also told in Apocalypse 18, verse 4, to go out from her lest they receive her plagues. You remember the ten plagues that afflicted Egypt? It's a reference back to that. And then also we recall, finally, that the Passover lamb saved Israel, and then the Lamb of God saves the saints. That Lamb of God has appeared earlier. We're going to see him come back again very soon in the Apocalypse. That's a, that's a frequent theme that comes back. The Lamb of God is prevalent throughout the old, uh, throughout this, uh, the Apocalypse. And it's a beautiful image because it is always seen by the Jews as a Passover image. So in a sense, the book of the Apocalypse is about a new Passover. It's not the Passover that was done in the time of Moses. This is a new Passover from a new Egypt, from the slavery, not of physical slavery in a location in North Africa, but slavery from sin. That's what our blessed Lord is delivering us from. And that's the, uh, the image that he's presenting to us. So Babylon gets destroyed. This harlot gets destroyed. Uh, people cry out, Babylon the Great has fallen. So there we see the harlot being unseated, cast off the beast and the flames around her. She's getting burned, so she's not having a good day at all. Uh, but that's, she deserves it, huh? So the, she's, she destroyed the true temple, our blessed Lord. Um, but now we have some mourners for Babylon. These hapless fellows are mourning for this harlot who had fornication with the kings of the earth, etc. So who are these mourners and what are, what are they doing? There's three that stand off, stand afar off, and they mourn over Babylon's destruction. So these three that we're going to see are very interesting characters. There's three groups. They are the kings of the earth, then they are the merchants, and then the sailors. Now, um, I was once a sailor, so I'm not going to uh, condemn all the mariners here, but the sailors, we're going to see uh, why, why that is uh, in a moment. Okay, so these are obviously symbolic, uh, the symbolic language that's going on here. Uh, the kings of the earth, the merchants, and the sailors. So we're going to see why these three are mourning. So let's take a look. There's the kings of the earth that mourn for the destruction of Babylon. We see that in Apocalypse chapter 18, verse 9. The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived in delicacies with her, delights with her, shall weep and bewail themselves over her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for fear of her torments, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. It's interesting, we're, we're going to see that come back. Each of the three mourners speak about the hour of, you know, her hour of destruction, or in one hour she is destroyed. This is actually another proof of the Joannine authorship of this book. Uh, the Joannine authorship that St. John wrote this book because he speaks of the hour that comes back over and over. It's a theme that runs throughout his gospel. And here we see the hour of destruction of Babylon. We see that come back. The Lamb of God, that's the only place we have a, a, a really strong reference to uh, the, the Lamb of God. That comes in the Apocalypse. It comes in St. John's uh, Gospel. So there are some expressions that only show up in St. John's Gospel and in the Apocalypse. Uh, so uh, we're going to see we're going to see that similarity. So there's the kings of the earth. They mourn poor unhappy creatures because they're mourning, they had committed fornication with her, lived in delights with her. But then there are the merchants of the earth. As we read in Apocalypse chapter 18 verse 11, the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for her, for no man shall buy their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, of pearls and fine linen, purple and silk and scarlet. There it is again, the purple, silk and scarlet, just like we saw the Whore of Babylon was donned in the purple, silk, and scarlet. 
And as Josephus said, this is almost runs like a, like a list from Josephus wars when he's describing the destruction of the temple. This list that is here in Apocalypse chapter 18 verse 12 is like a list of the things that they stripped from the temple itself. And they gave to Titus the gold, precious stones, pearls, purple and scarlet. Josephus specifically mentions that. And of course, the harlot was clothed in purple and scarlet. So all these things are connecting the reader who were familiar with the destruction of the temple uh, or afterwards, after it happened, they could see this is what is was referring to. This is what St. John was foreshadowing here. So those merchants then uh, mourned for her as well. Uh, it mentions also the spices, wheat, beasts, sheep, horses, etc. And then it also says, and slaves and souls of men. So these merchants uh, are people who are selling the souls of men, as it were, purchasing the souls of men. They are taking the souls of men. Then there's another group that mourns. Uh, and this last group, as I said, it's a symbolic, has a symbolic meaning, and it is the sailors, okay? But remember, the sailors, they do their work on the sea. They ply the sea, and that is... Remember, a reference to the Gentiles. Okay, so this is that other group, the sailors that work on the sea. In Apocalypse chapter 18, verse 17, says that these also mourn. It says, Every shipmaster and all that sail into the lake and mariners and as many as work in the sea stood afar off and cried, seeing the place of her burning, saying, What city is like to this great city? And they cast dust upon their heads and cried, weeping and mourning, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein all were made rich, that had ships at sea by reason of her prices. For in one hour, again, there it is again, in one hour she is made desolate. Now, I don't want to make too much of this part, but in each of these groups, we notice that they stand afar off. And they're witnessing the destruction of this harlot, they're just witnessing the destruction of uh, Babylon, and as we said, this has a reference to Jerusalem and the temple. Does that sound familiar, the standing far off, watching the destruction? You might say this is juxtaposed to our Lord's crucifixion, because our Lord is the true temple. He is the true temple. And he also had his mourners who stood afar off. You know, the women, the holy women that followed. And they stood afar off and they witnessed his destruction. They mourned for him. But these were virtuous people. Unlike these hapless fellows here, the uh, kings who committed fornication with Babylon, the merchants who sold her goods and were enthralled with her wealth, and then the, uh, the sailors who said, you know, this is the great city. What other city is like this? And there was great pride in, in the city. The sailors uh, were very proud of their, uh, their, applying their, their connection to uh, Jerusalem and selling her wares as well. So these, these uh, evil mourners are almost juxtaposed against the holy mourners that stood also afar off. In each group here that is mentioned in Revelation 18 stood afar off, seeing the destruction of this Babylon. Jerusalem. But of course we know that the holy women stood afar off and mourned for our most blessed Lord. But let's delve a little closer to see why we have these three groups and what they symbolize, okay? The kings of the earth who fornicated with her, as it says. Well, this has a correspondence, a subtle reference to the concupiscence of the flesh. Now, keep in mind, of course, these kings of the earth and the f committing fornication with her, it's not a physical fornication that we're talking about here. It's actually, it's speaking about how they uh, sort of, she prostituted, Jerusalem prostituted herself to all these foreign people, ingratiated herself to foreign nations, ended up worshiping her gods. Solomon even did this and engaged in false worship. So in this sense, Jerusalem was like a prostitute fornicating with uh, the kings of the earth, you know. Think about how the, the high priest, even at our Lord's crucifixion, said, We have no king but Caesar. This horrible blasphemy. Not even God? We have no king but Caesar? 
Well, he's committing fornication spiritually to ingratiate himself to the Roman Empire, to accomplish his will, to get his way. That's really what's being sp spoken of, this kind of fornication. It's not a physical fornication, but nonetheless, the terminology is used, fornication. And there's a subtle reference then to this aspect of, uh, of sin and vice, the concupiscence of the flesh. Well, then we also have the merchants of the earth who sold her riches. Who sold her riches. Well, the ones who sell the riches are concerned. They're, they're impressed with the things that captivate the eye. The concupiscence of the eyes, then, is a reference to those merchants who sold her riches, the riches of, Jer of uh, Jerusalem. So the concupiscence of the eyes, that's always a reference to the riches. You're enthralled by something, you see the gold, the pearls, the fine embroidery, it captivates the eye, and so there's a concupiscence of the eye that is connected with avarice, greed. Then finally, there's the sailors, the sailors that work in the sea. They admired the greatness of Jerusalem, and they even said, what city is like this great city? What city is like to this great city? They admired the greatness, and this is a connection to the pride of life. These are the three things that in 1st John uh, chapter 2 verse 16 St. John says that this is what's in the world. The concupiscence of the flesh, concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's interesting they're even in that same order and in the same way they come in, in this, this order here in the apocalypse. The kings of the earth have a reference then that, that fornicated with uh, Jerusalem spiritually. They have a reference to the concupiscence of the flesh. You have the merchants of the earth who sold the riches of Jerusalem and engaged in commerce with her to sell her wares and so Jerusalem would sort of prostitute herself out so she could sell her wares to the world. It's a reference to the concupiscence of the eyes connected with riches. And then the sailors that work in the sea, it says that they were they admired her greatness. That's one thing that the sailors did in the apocalypse here, admiring her greatness. Who is like this city? Who is like to this great city? Now, doesn't this sound familiar? Do you remember hearing this earlier? Who is like the who is like the beast? Who is like the beast? Huh? You know. So we see that we saw that earlier um, in the apocalypse, and so this is. Um, so, and the response, of course, on the side of the good is, who is like God, right? St. Michael, Mikael, that's what it means. Who is like God? This was St. Michael's battle cry in response to the evil rebellion of the dragon. He said, who is like God? We don't say who is like this great city. This city cannot match Almighty God. And so we have then the uh, concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, the pride of life. These are undone uh, by those great uh, evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Poverty helps undo the concupiscence of the eyes. Chastity, of course, undoes the concupiscence of the flesh. And obedience undoes the pride of life. So this, these are the remedies for these three concupiscences. So even though Jerusalem, yes, she, she did these other things, she uh, engaged with, in, in sort of selling her, her, all of her goods to the foreign con, uh, you know, commerce, even though our Lord said you have nothing to do with these other people, and yet they, they still did, and they fell into the idolatry because of that. Also, there's a very subtle, just by these references here to the kings, the merchants, and the sailors, a very subtle reference to these three vices. This is also, in other words, how Jerusalem sold herself by these three things, by the concupiscence of the flesh, concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now we're going to see another parallel that happens here because the language that's used here by St. John in this destruction of Babylon, this fall of Babylon, echoes back very, very closely to the fall of Tyre a city up in the north, uh, by the northern kingdoms, there is a city of Tyre. And we're going to see why 
in just a moment. But first, let's see the comparisons the, between the fall of Tyre and the fall of Jerusalem. So let's take a look at that. We see in Ezekiel, as he describes the fall of Tyre in chapter 27, he says that the kings lament. In cha Ezekiel chapter 27, verse 35. We also see that the merchants lament. Ezekiel 27, 21. And then, of course, surprise, surprise, the sailors lament. Ezekiel 27, 26 through 30. Well, that's a neat coincidence, isn't it? These same three that mourned the fall of Babylon also mourned Tyre. Uh, what's the point there? Well, there's another comparison. Let, let's take a look. Remember, we said, who is like this great city? Who is like Babylon? Well, we see those same words used in Ezekiel 27, verse 32. What city is like to Tyre? So, what's the point of this? Why these comparisons? What, what does the fall of Tyre have to do with the fall of Babylon? And what does it have to do with the fall of Jerusalem? Tyre was the city that helped Jerusalem build the temple. Now, it's not that they committed a sin in doing so. No, they were, they were helping the Jews at the time. But the fall of Tyre and all these similarities are being paralleled up because it's about to prophesy the fall of Babylon, Babylon, which is Jerusalem, and the fall and destruction of the temple. Tyre's connection to Jerusalem, their claim to fame, if you will, was they helped Jerusalem build the temple. The cedars of Lebanon, that's where they came from. They were supplied by Tyre. Uh, the, they sent down uh, stones. They sent down, uh, the, they, they, they brought the things by, by, by the water. So they brought them from Tyre through the water uh, to the Mediterranean and then brought them overland to Jerusalem. So you see how the sailors are interacting there and whatnot. That is the point then that Tyre helped build the temple in Jerusalem as we see in the third book of Kings or first Kings if you're using an RSV. Um, and hopefully you're not using an NAB because that, that stands for not actually the Bible. Uh, Although I've heard some people argue that uh, a little bit harshly that uh, RSV stands for resembles some of the Vulgate. Um, but, uh, you know, so, uh, the RSV, don't get me wrong, it's a pretty good translation. However, there are some things that, uh, that are a little bit mistaken. And now that I've dug this hole and I'm probably going to get a lot of hate mail, I should explain why. So um, if you have, if you ha are using an RSV, please don't you know, throw tomatoes at your computer screen or hate mail at me. I will show you why we recall that he rested upon the breast of our most blessed Lord. Remember he said, uh, one of you shall betray me, our Lord says this. And then they all said, is it I, Lord? Is it I, Lord? And our blessed Lord, uh, you know, says, you know, he doesn't say who it is. And of course, St. Peter called... There was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. And then in verse 25, St. John, leaning on the breast of Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? The RSV doesn't say that. The RSV says, the one who is leaning near the breast of Jesus. Leaning near, I mean, they're all near the breast of Jesus in one sense. They're all sitting very close around the table, reclining at table. But this translation, the, the douay Reims translation says he was leaning on the breast, upon the breast of Jesus. 
as opposed to just leaning near the breast of Jesus, right? It's a more intimate and close relationship that St. John has as the translation in the Douay Rheims renders as opposed to the uh, RSV. So for that reason, some people will say RSV stands for resembles some of the Vulgate. That's a bit harsh, but uh, anyway. Let's get back to that. I just wanted to fill that hole before uh, I moved on, lest I get uh, gobs of hate mail. So then finally we have the destruction of Babylon. Uh, we see in verse 21, a mighty angel cast a stone, um, as it were a great millstone, cast it into the sea. We can actually see this in this artistic rendition. Here's the mighty angel. Here's the millstone. It's heading right for the sea, for the waters. And Babylon right here, we see it in flames. And there's the harlot, and you see the flames over here. Again, these are multiple images that we saw. This image we saw, the harlot, back in chapter 17. This image of Babylon being destroyed, we we're seeing here in chapter 18. But there's the millstone. As we read in Apocalypse 18, verse 21, a mighty angel took up a stone, as it were a great millstone, cast it into the sea. With such violence as this, shall Babylon, that great city, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So, finally, there's another rather mysterious verse which I find very, very captivating at the end of this chapter. It's a verse that has a reference to something that shows up in St. John's Gospel again, another connection. This is the only place, by the way, where this connection is made in the New Testament, in two places. In the Apocalypse, chapter 18, and in St. John's Gospel, chapter 3. There's an Old Testament reference, but in the New Testament, th these, what I'm about to say is only referenced in the Apocalypse and in St. John's Gospel. Another indication, another hint of the Johannine authorship of this book. I say that just because there are some uh, modernists who try and say that St. John didn't write the thing. That's just nonsense. It's hogwash. There's external evidence. There's internal evidence. This is one of the examples of the internal evidence. And what is the passage I'm referring to? What's the phrase I'm referring to? Let's take a look. It's in Apocalypse chapter 18, verse 23. There we read that the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. The voice of the bridegroom, rather mysterious expression, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more in thee. Where was this used again in the New Testament? Again, only in St. John's Gospel, in John chapter 3, verse 29. This is when St. John the Baptist was asked, Are thou the Messiah? And he said, I am not. And he makes his case to say that he is not the Messiah because he says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who standeth and heareth him, rejoices, rejoices with joy because of the voice of the bridegroom. Interesting, the voice of the bridegroom. That's the only other time that expression shows up. It shows up here in the Apocalypse. It shows up in the Gospel of St. John. I should say in the New Testament, it does show up in the Old. We're just going to take a look at that in a second here because we say, what does that mean? What is this voice of the bridegroom? What is he talking about? But remember the principle we saw earlier? That principle, we need to follow that principle. That mysterious or unusual verses in the New Testament are illuminated by parallel ones in the Old. So if you find something that is unusual, that's difficult to explain, do a search in a good translation, good biblical translation for that term, that expression, and see if it shows up in the Old Testament. And sure enough, this one indeed does. It shows up in Jeremiah in several places. So we see the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more in all of thee. Well, Jeremiah has something to say about that. He's speaking about the Babylonian captivity, he says, I will cause to cease out of the cities of Judah and out of the streets of Jerusalem the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Jeremiah 7, verse 34. But he's not just 
saying the voice of the bridegroom, but notice what Jeremiah is connecting that voice of the bridegroom, that it's going to cease out of where? Where did he say it's going to cease out of? The cities, there it is, the cities of Judah and out of the streets of Jerusalem. But remember that Apocalypse says, The voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. What's the thee in Apocalypse 18, verse 23? That is Babylon. So now, when we see the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice will be cease, you know, the, 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 God will cause the, the voice to cease out of the cities of Judah and of Jerusalem, streets of Jerusalem. Again, another connection making Babylon Jerusalem. That's what's happening there. Babylon, Jerusalem. So That's not the only place, though, that Jeremiah references this. He says it again in uh, Jeremiah chapter 16, and then again in Jeremiah chapter 25. Let's take a look, though, a little more full quotation here from Apocalypse. This is the full quote from Apocalypse 18, 22 through 23. The sound of the mill shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of the lamp shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. In Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 10, he says, I will take away from them the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the mill and the light of the lamp. Notice, we already saw the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride. We saw that parallel. But look what else there is paralleled in these two verses. The sound of the mill shall be heard no more. And then the light of the lamp shall shine no more at all in thee, as well as the voice of the bridegroom. This is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. The light of the lamp, the light of the lamp, to the Jews, that the most important lamp in Jerusalem was the menorah, right? The seven-branch candlestick that was in the temple. On the Feast of uh, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, they would take, they would have a huge, huge lamp. The high priests and the, the priests that would light it had to climb ladders to get to the top, would put oil in it and light this. And it was a huge, was a large candelabra that was in the main part of the temple. Not inside the temple, it was in the courtyard of the temple, I should say. So this was outside, it was very elevated, very bright. And they would burn this for the entire week of the Feast of Tabernacles. And they said that it reflected off the gold of the temple and it just illuminated the entire city. That's how it was described by the ancients. It illuminated the entire city. But the light of the lamp shall shine no more in thee. For the Jews, the light of the lamp symbolized the light of God. The glory cloud, the Shekinah, that glory cloud, pillar of fire by day, you know, pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day, which signified the presence of Almighty God, the Holy Ghost, the voice of God, because it was out of that cloud that the voice came of Almighty God to speak to Moses and also to, uh, to speak to the, uh, the high priest or whatnot. So, the light of the lamp, the sound of the mill shall be no more heard at all in thee. So the, the mill is what gives them their sustenance. Right? At the mill you grind the wheat to make your bread. It will be no longer heard in you. So it's their sustenance, their substance is going to be removed. So of course this had a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem and it's being burnt just as Babylon was described as being burnt. Babylon, the great city that has fallen. Again, if you have questions, you can submit those on our Facebook page or also on YouTube on Census Fidelium if you want to submit some questions. And uh, we'll cover those in uh, just a second. So, one last note on that voice. That voice is mentioned, it's not the voice of the bridegroom, as I mentioned, that's only in St. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 29, and then here in the Apocalypse, chapter 18. 
but we do see the voice, it doesn't say the bridegroom, but it's a reference to the voice. And especially when we realize that in John chapter 3, verse 29, St. John the Baptist is the one who's speaking, who says, I hear the voice of the bridegroom and rejoice. He hears the voice. He says, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. I, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. It is the bridegroom who has the bride. He says, but I hear the voice of the bridegroom, and therefore I rejoice. Well, remember what happened in St. Luke chapter 2, where St. John, again, hears a voice, and he rejoices. He leaps with joy within his mother's womb. And that is indeed what St. Elizabeth mentions when filled with the Holy Ghost, she says to the Blessed Mother, Who am I that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? She says, in fact, Luke chapter 2, uh, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 42. She cried, she was filled with the Holy Ghost. She cried aloud with a loud voice, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. And then later on, that same infant who became an adult, St. John the Baptist, said, I hear the voice of the bridegroom, and I rejoice. So Our Lady, then, is the one who carries the voice of the bridegroom. It's a beautiful privilege she has. Uh, and she is, she is the one who carries the voice. And remember the voice that God spoke uh, through the Shekinah, and the voice of God came through that pillar of fire, that overshadowing of the Holy Ghost in the temple. And then, of course, Our Lady had the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost when she uh, conceived our Most Blessed Lord by divine almighty power. Beautiful, subtle reference to that voice and to the voice of the bridegroom. So when God says that I will cause the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride to cease from thee, well, he's saying my voice will no longer be there. I will not be there. The presence of the Holy Ghost will not be there in Jerusalem. Again, this is foretelling the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 AD. And yes, although it has a reference back to the Old Testament, there is a future reference to the destruction of the world, right? So that's, there, there's kind of multiple levels of fulfillment. Uh, there's a, a preterist interpretation, that means this all happened in the past, and there's a futurist in interpretation, which is, this is coming in the future, but the, the truth lies somewhere in the combination of, of the two, in the, in the middle of those, okay? So, um, we've got a few minutes yet. We might not have time to finish chapter 19, but why don't we try and delve into it, okay? So let's move into chapter 19. In chapter 19, this is a good part. This is where we start to see the glory of God return. Uh, the glory of God, the victory of God. The saints glorify God because of his judgments. We also are going to see Christ's victory over the beast and the kings of the earth. The Lamb of God makes an appearance again. The saints, the 24 ancients, the 24 elders who cast their crowns down, we saw earlier. Uh, we're going to see that again. Now, in this, in this chapter is the only place in the New Testament where a certain word which we use all the time shows up in the New Testament. And it's the word Alleluia. The word Alleluia only shows up in four places in the New Testament. And those four places are all in this one chapter of the Apocalypse, chapter 19. So we see at the very beginning of the Apocalypse, the, the saints glorify God. He heard the voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, which is a Hebrew word, which means praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Salvation and glory and power is to our God. For true and just are his judgments, and he hath judged the great harlot which corrupted the earth with fornication and hath revenged the blood of his servants at her hands. And again they said, Alleluia. 
and then in ver that's in verse 3, and then in verse 4 again it happens. Then the 24 ancients adored, and the four living creatures which we saw earlier fell down and adored God that sitteth upon the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia, praise the Lord. It's a joyful exclamation in Hebrew, which means praise the Lord. It's an exclamation. We see the word show up yet again in verse 6. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. Remember we saw a great multitude earlier on in uh, the apocalypse where it described this great multitude that no man could number after naming those uh, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel that is named there. A great multitude as the voice of many waters. Now we have the voice of the bride, as it were, responding to the bridegroom. The voice of many waters, the voice of all the people who have converted and been brought into the church. They respond. That's the voice of the bride, the voice of the church, responding to the voice of the bridegroom. And they respond, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, hath reigned. Let us be glad and rejoice and give glory to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. The marriage of the Lamb is come. We just saw about the voice of the bridegroom and the bride, obviously a reference to a marriage, and now we see it again. The marriage of the Lamb has come. And His wife hath prepared herself. The wife is the bride, it's the church, that hath prepared herself through virtue. Unlike those that mourned the harlot who were given to concupiscence of the flesh, concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life, those that are connected with the bride have prepared themselves by virtue, by tribulation, by suffering, by chastising their body and subjecting it, uh, lest we be cast, uh, cast off ourselves, like St. Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 9.27. I chastise my body, put it under subjection, lest I who have preached to others should myself be a castaway. So the bride, the wife, has prepared herself. We're actually going to see here a culmination of several things, several images that showed up earlier in the earlier chapters. Let's take a look at those. There's several chapters, a couple of chapters where this shows up. So in Apocalypse chapter 4 and 5, and in Apocalypse chapter 7, we see these different things happen. We've got it all laid out for you. It's running a little bit short on time. We see the loud voices in heaven. Again, loud voices in heaven, Apocalypse 11. And then in Apocalypse 19, the voice of the multitude. We see the 24 elders fall down in adoration. They don't just fall down. They're falling down in adoration before God. That happens in Apocalypse 4 and 5. It happens in Apocalypse 11, and then it happens again in Apocalypse 19. The four living creatures also, I don't have them written down there, but the four living creatures that represent the, the Gospels, Saints Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they appear as well. The Lord God Almighty is praised in all three. Then in Apocalypse chapter 4 and 5, we see lightning. We do see lightning and thunder. I didn't mention it here, but in Apocalypse chapter 4 and 5, we see lightning and thunder. Apocalypse 11, we see lightning. Then in Apocalypse 19, thunder. So there are a number of similarities then that are taking place because this is all about the victory of the Word, the King, and the Lord. So this multitude rejoices. His wife has prepared herself. And notice that in chapter 19, verse 8, we see what she is adorned with, what she is clothed with. She is indeed clothed, okay? So, you know, don't let the uh, Christopher West proponents uh, kid you otherwise. In heaven they are clothed. She's clothed herself with fine linen glittering in white. For the fine linen are the justifications of the saints. That's what they are clothed with. They have been clothed with their virtue. They have... Uh, in their, their pounding out the linen, because it takes a, a, it's a, a rather physical process of preparing the linen. There's, it has to be pounded out, and there's, a, it, there's an analogy there to penance, the way the linen is prepared. They are adorned with fine linen. Unlike the harlot, it was adorned with all this pizzazz and glittering you know, golden jewels and uh, uh, excessive 
um, excessive uh, instruments of harlotry. Uh, not that jewels are <laughs> instruments of harlotry, but you know, th that's how she was. Right. Blessed are they of the earlier there was something else you call that was it right. That's who die in the Lord. rest from there so in both verses chapter 14 verse 13 and right here in chapter 19 verse 9 he's also told blessed are they and we see that what the 14 verse 13 uh, have how they prepare themselves they have died in the Lord their works follow them and so here also in chapter 19, verse 8, that they are clothed with the justifications, that is, their good works done in the state of great grace, done meritoriously in our blessed Lord. And then he, we also see uh, something that we saw back in chapter 12, verse 17. We see the, those who have the testimony of Jesus. The last time we saw that expression, it was mirrored back in chapter 12, verse 17, where he says uh, here, you know, St. John kind of taken by this, this angel. He saw this angel. He was uh, terrified by it. He, he falls down at his feet to adore him. And the angel says, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So remember, those who have the testimony of Jesus, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, are, are the children of the woman who is the mother of the Lord. And then he said, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's what we are given. We are given the spirit at our baptism. And then we see our blessed Lord. We're probably going to have to wrap it up here in a second. Uh, but I just want to make a connection before we do down to verse 14. Clothed in fine linen. Sorry, Christopher West. But anyway, uh, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Those That linen has been made clean in the blood of the Lamb. It seems... Confusing to us that how could something be made clean in the blood of something? It's the blood of the Lamb which purifies. This is an idea that is not foreign to the Jews because back in Exodus 24, at the foot of Mount Sinai, God told Moses to sprinkle the people with blood. St. Paul in the book of Hebrews says that he had blood and water. And that's the instrument with which he sprinkled the people, blood and water. And so in Holy Mass, we have the blood of our blessed Lord, which has been mingled with a little drop of water at the offertory. But we are made clean. Our, our linen, our clothing has been made clean, has been made fine through our penances and through the blood of the Lamb. The justifications of the saints, that's what the linen is according to Apocalypse chapter 19, verse 8, and it has been made clean. Our justifications have been made clean, not because they're our justifications, our works. They are made clean because of the blood of the Lamb. That's what purifies our works, the blood of the Lamb. When they are done in the state of grace, those works are good. Those works are meritorious. Uh, that's a whole different discussion. You can see that in 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, but it's not something we can really get into right now. Just in case people... I want to challenge that idea of meritorious uh, good works. We also see that in Romans chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 4 through 10, where uh, works can be meritorious, done in the Lord. 
So, uh, we are going to see in a moment the, the great culmination of this victory. We're going to see the heavenly Jerusalem, the bride of Christ coming down from heaven. And that heavenly Jerusalem, like a mother, is our mother, fully represented by the most blessed mother, who indeed is our mother. We can talk about that later when we get to that part about the heavenly Jerusalem and how Our Lady is indeed our mother. So I kind of can't wait to get to that part that's in Apocalypse 21. Uh, we're almost there. We, I want to finish up a little bit more because there are some important titles of our Blessed Lord that are given in uh, Apocalypse chapter 19. But we're running a bit short on time. I do want to get to the questions that there may have been submitted uh, on our Facebook page or on YouTube, on the Census Fidelium. So if, uh, if you have those questions, I can, uh, I can get to those now. But um, So we've covered uh, some good ground here, and uh, we're going to keep on going. So I hope you can join us for the next one. But we're going to answer the questions now, so let's, let's see what, uh, what we have. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> the question is, first question is, uh, Father, are we like the mourners of Babylon when we weep for the devolution of our republic? Is there no room for ma national pride? Uh, well, I don't think we're like the mourners of Babylon when we weep for the devolution of our republic because what these mourners are weeping over, remember what they were weeping over. They were the ones that committed fornication. Fornication it comes from the Greek porne, which means an unlawful sexual union, unlawful sexual activity. Fornication, committing fornication with uh, Jerusalem, the kings committing fornication with her, is not a physical sexual uh, uh, illicitness, although that is grave sin, but this is spoken of on a spiritual level. It's like spiritually they were fornicating with her. They were involved in an illicit union with her. That's what they were mourning is the loss of that union. Okay, so they're mourning, they're mourning the loss of this, this uh, accomplice in sin. That's not what we should mourn, but we can certainly mourn the loss of virtue in our country. I don't think we're being like the mourners in that case. Uh, remember what each one was mourning was a particular thing. The riches, right? The merchants were mourning the loss of the riches, the wealth that they were losing out on because of the, uh, the nations or the city, in this case, the city's uh, evil. And so it was decimated, and so they were mourning the loss of the riches. And then, of course, the sailors, were, they were mourning, how, this is our great city that we were so proud of. They were in admiration. Who is like this great city? They were mourning the, the loss of the great status that Jerusalem had as the crossroads of the world in, in a certain sense there in the Middle East, a trading crossroads, and so it was a place of a lot of influence. That's what they were mourning, earthly things. If we mourn our country for the loss of virtue, the loss of justice in our country, that's, that's proper, to I think, to, to mourn those things. Uh, so, let's see. Another question. Father, are we individually the bride of Christ, or is it the collective church that is the bride of Christ? It seems like Origen was saying the former, but St. Bernard was suggesting the latter. So, in, in a certain sense, the whole church, it, it's, I, my, my short answer is, I'm going to go with the latter, okay? I suggest the latter because of what St. Bernard says, but also uh, the, the church is, is the, the bride. It is spotless. It is clean. That's purified, okay? The church purified. We on this earth are provisional members of the church. Us in the church militant who are still viators, right? We're still on the via. We're still on the way to God still on the way to the promised land, please God. We are provisional members, temporary, hopefully permanent, but temporary members. That membership in our church, which started at our baptism, should be permanent if we keep in the state of grace. 
we die in the state of grace. Now, a person who loses the state of grace doesn't lose membership in the church. I want to clarify that. But if we die without the state of grace, if we die in the state of sin, we do lose membership. We are not part of the church. We are separated from the church if we die in the state of mortal sin. And so the church, the bride, especially as spoken of here, is the purified bride. It's the bride in heaven, all those that have made it. So when we say, is this soul, are we individually collective souls? You know, are we, are, I mean, <laughs> are we individually brides of Christ? Are we in, or is it collectively? Well, I would say collectively as the bride of Christ that is in heaven, right? So we have this provisional membership, uh, but yet God, in a certain sense, does speak of wooing the heart and, and calling out to each soul. So there, there is an aspect of that on the individual level, especially when we see it in the religious. That is why we call religious, women religious, the brides of Christ. We don't say that you know, priests are brides of Christ. We don't say that brothers are brides of Christ. We do say that of women religious, right? Sisters, nuns, they are brides of Christ. Now, um, sometimes people kind of hijack, <laughs> people who are not in the religious state can sometimes hijack that term, like, oh, I'm a bride of Christ too. And Well, the women religious are. They, they're the ones who have given up all. They've forsaken all the delights of the flesh or anything like that. They've given those things up they are living lives of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And they are truly brides of Christ on a spiritual level. Of course, it's not a physical level. It's a spiritual level. So, properly speaking, individually, women religious are brides of Christ. I would say that. But then collectively, the church is a bride of Christ, especially as purified. Okay? The bride of Christ spoken here. You know, We saw the bride. She's made clean. Right? Uh, this, this bride hath prepared herself, his wife hath prepared herself for the marriage supper, the eternal marriage supper. That means the preparation that happens, you know, uh, remedial in purgatory or uh, direct by going directly through to heaven. Okay? hope that answers your question. There is an aspect how God woos each soul, so there's something of that. But again, strictly speaking, I would say bride of Christ, women religious, and then collectively the church. Okay? All right. Is it possible that there are people alive now who hear God's voice like in the Old Testament? It certainly is possible. It certainly is. So, I'm not saying I've heard that, so I don't think I'm implying anything. But So don't, don't read in anything into that. But it is certainly possible uh, that there are people alive now who hear the voice of God. Mm-hmm. We also have to consider how that is received as well. So in the time of the Old Testament, people wouldn't take you as being odd if you heard the voice of God. They believed in God. They worshipped God in their own... Even the pagans who were trying to worship something, they were worshipping devils. Psalm 95 verse 5 says that the gods of the pagans, gods of the Gentiles are devils. They didn't know it, perhaps, you know, and, um, you know but they... Uh, they had a sense that you had to worship something that was not yourself. So it wouldn't be unheard of to speak of, I heard the voice of God. Well, our world today is, they'll think you're crazy if you, if you say something like that. So uh, that's probably a reason why any who do hear the voice of God are keeping it to themselves because of the response. Um, if you have not read it, I would, I would really, you're, you're depriving yourself of a treat if you have not read The Way of Divine Love by Sister Josefa Menendez, a religious who had a very difficult time getting into religious life. In fact, she was 29 years old when she finally entered. She entered four times. It was only in the fourth time that she stayed. She seemed to be hapless, you know, fits and starts. But, and finally, she was 29 years old, which back then, you were... You, are, you should have already been, you know, back in the old days, you would have been married by, you know, 18 or whatnot. And so, 29, she had not yet found her vocation. She finally entered into the convent. She only lived for four more years. She died at the age of 33. And our Lord began to come to her and speak to her. Not only the voice of God, but she would see him. 
and he asked her to write these things. And this was actually a cross to her. She just wanted to live the religious life. She had such a hard time getting into the religious life. She just wanted the peace and the regularity of religious life. And our Lord had another plan for her, and he was appearing to her and speaking to her, and she had to write these things down. So this was in the 1920s, so this isn't too long ago. And so uh, if you have not read her book, The Way of Divine Love, uh, I would I would highly recommend reading that. So, okay. Let's see. There is a question about the King James Bible for Catholics, a full 1611 authorized version text from Walshingham Publishing, designed for private use for Catholics far beyond the ordinary. It's well, I'll tell you about the genesis of the King James Bible. Uh, it was based upon a 13th century Byzantine text. Uh, Erasmus, I think, had a part in, in uh, getting that and, and translating that and um, passing that on, but that was a 13th century Byzantine text. That's a rather late text to be using as a source. So it has gone back, it has been revised a number of times because of this, and that's, that's actually the genesis of the Revised Standard Version. It started out as the King James Version. Now the authorized text there, the authorized, it was authorized by King James, a Protestant king who said, yes, we're going to commission this thing and it will be translated. Um, so he didn't have the authority to do that, but at any rate, he, uh, he's the one who authorized, that's the authorized version. 1611, so it's actually, it actually published, it was published two years after the Old Testament was in the Douay Rheims version, which I use, and then even more years, 1585 is when the New Testament was published for the Douay Rheims. So the Douay Rheims is actually the oldest English translation that's in print. Um, they did have to go back to revise this, this text, the King James Version, and that's, why, that's where they came up with the RSV, it was a revised standard version because it was revised from the uh, the um, uh, King James Bible, and then they sort of not redacted, but you know went back through and put back some of those translations that were taken out or changed to not reflect the Catholic translations or the Catholic interpretations of texts that could have had could have gone a couple of ways, one a Catholic way, one a way that wasn't. You know where there's a, some ambiguity, so the Revised Standard Version. Catholic edition, that's the one that put in or retranslated those verses that were weakened, as it were, made less Catholic, and that is where we get the Ignatius Bible, RSV Catholic edition, that's the Ignatius Bible, and uh, so it just had to go through a number of revisions. Uh, I'm not as familiar with this one with from Walsingham, Walsingham Publishing, uh, designed for private use for Catholics. Uh, so I just don't like the genesis of it because it came from the King James, the authorized version, authorized by uh, Protestant King James, um, but also the fact that it was originally translated from a 13th century Byzantine text, which is rather late. It's a rather late text to be using. It'd be better to go back to an earlier text and translate from uh, a, a source that is closer to the actual uh, writings, uh, the actual times of the apostles. So, okay, hope that is uh, maybe it's not a satisfying answer, but it, uh, maybe it's uh, at least a complete answer. Okay, so other questions. So let's see. Uh, question about the Latin Mass. So looks like there's there's other questions on the Apocalypse. I'd be happy to answer those, but there's some off-topic ones. That's okay. Uh, so there's a question about the Latin Mass. Why do the deacons or altar boys hold up the vestments during Mass? Ah, this is a very good question. And why does the priest turn toward the wall? Well, he's actually not turned towards the wall. He's turned toward our Lord. He's turned to the east, ad orientum, which is towards the east. Why do we do it? It's because all the early Christians did it, for one. That's one of the origins of our worship is that we faced east in the early days of the church because the east is a symbol of the rising of the sun. Christ said, I am the light of the world. The west is 
it symbolizes death. That's the, the end of the world. You know, the, the, the west is where the sun sets, but the east is where the sun rises. So it's a symbol of our blessed Lord rising. So the early Christians would always worship facing east, ad orientum, that's what it means. So the priest is actually not facing the wall, but he is facing east. But also if you're in a well-constructed church, the tabernacle will be there on the altar and the priest will be facing our blessed Lord, the Holy Ghost, the glory cloud, the Shekinah is there. Our blessed Lord is there. God is there. He's facing Almighty God. So as he's speaking the words to Almighty God, he faces him. Just like we do out of simple courtesy. We face each other when we speak. Whereas if I were to turn my chair around and face that direction when I'm speaking actually to you, that would seem rather rude. But when I'm speaking to God, I believe I should face him. So in the Holy Mass, in the Latin Mass, the priest facing the tabernacle, facing our Lord in the tabernacle, is facing God, speaking to him. But then when he addresses you, he turns around, and that's why he says in a number of points in the Mass, he turns around and says, Dominus Fobiscum, the Lord be with you. So he turns towards you at those different times. He preaches facing you. Uh, that's what we do at this church. I don't know if maybe he's not facing you when he preaches at your church. But I'm just kidding. But uh, So at any rate, uh, he is actually facing Almighty God, and he's facing the East. About the vestments, the deacons, the altar boys, hold up the vestments during Mass. That is at a very particular point of the Mass. It's at the consecration, the elevation. Now, I have heard some say that, well, there was a historical reason. Uh, I'm not sure I buy this historical reason so much because it's not like the priest is a weakling up there but so they say that well as the as the chasubles got more and more jewel encrusted and heavier and thicker material then you know as he lifted his hands for the elevation he lifted the sacred chalice at the elevation in order to help him lift his arms they would lift the chasuble I mean the priest is not a weakling he's not up there sitting there like I can't lift my arms because I'm wearing a chasuble you know, so I, I don't really buy that history. ...be healed. And so she came up behind him, touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. Power went out from him. He noticed it. He knew it. And he said, Who has touched me? And so he said, Woman, how great is thy faith. So in that moment, the altar boy is touching the very hem of the garment of the priest. At that moment, while the priest is holding up our most blessed Lord, he represents the church like that woman, that nameless woman. I believe it's chapter 17, but I, I don't recall off the hand. But when they were fighting the nation of Amalek, the Israelites fighting the nation of Amalek, Joshua, whose name is actually Jesus, right? that's the Greek form, Jesus, he was engaged in the battle. Meanwhile, Moses was up on the mountain. Moses was up on the mountain, extending his arms, lifting his arms in the form of a cross. A short or a modified version of it is like this. That's what the priest is doing when he holds his hands like this at Holy Mass. It's actually just a modified, a, a temperate or modified or uh, more modest, as it were, version of that. So Moses had his arms extended out in the form of a cross, but he needed support because he was tiring. And when his arms lowered, they would lose the battle. When his arms were up like a cross, they would win the battle. And so, Aaron and Hur, H-U-R is a man, that's his name, Hur, H-U-R, they stood on either side holding up his arms. So when you see the altar boys on either side of the priest 
holding up the chasuble at that moment where the priest is lifting up his arms for the elevation. You can think of that moment when they're on the top of the mountain, the altar steps, like Moses was on the top of the mountain, foreshadowing another mountain, Mount Calvary, where our Lord extended his arms with not Aaron and her at his feet, but Our Lady and St. John to support him. You can think of that when you have the next Latin Mass that you attend, okay? Another question, um, why does a priest hide his face during a solemn Mass? The third priest, ah, I see. So you're thinking of the subdeacon, okay? Which could be a priest at, at a solemn uh, Mass. The subdeacon covers his face with the humeral veil. The humeral veil is that veil he has over his shoulders. What he has in his hand at that moment that you don't see, you may not have, you may not see what he has. He actually is holding the paten. The paten is a symbol in a certain sense of us. It's a symbol of a soul in a state of grace that is going to receive our Lord. But before we can do that, we, there's a certain separation. We, you know, we are not worthy to approach our blessed Lord. The paten is taken away. It's covered. The subdeacon holds the paten, and he's holding that paten in front of his face. That's actually what he's doing. He's holding that paten under the veil, under the humeral veil before his face. And he is veiling his face. He is hiding his face from the altar. There's a reason. He, at that moment, is symbolizing the cherubim. The cherubim with their wings, and the subdeacon with his humeral veil, which resembles wings that he has on his shoulders. He hides his face, just as the cherubim did. They veiled their faces. The two cherubim that were on the Ark of the Covenant veiled their faces with their wings. And they did this uh, out of humility, out of an unworthiness to see God. But then at a certain moment, the subdeacon brings the paten up to the altar. And if you're at a solemn mass, take note when it is that the subdeacon ascends the altar. It's at the point in the Our Father, the priest singing the Our Father says, et dimite nobis debita nostra and forgive us our trespasses. At that moment, then the subdeacon genuflects and ascends the altar. We can only approach the altar, we can only approach the altar for Holy Communion when our sins have been forgiven, our trespasses have been forgiven, have been absolved through a sacramental confession to a priest necessary for any mortal sin. We have to have a sacramental confession to a priest. Don't ever receive Holy Communion in a state of mortal sin. Don't ever do that to your soul. Don't do that to our Lord. Don't do that to the priest. Don't have the priest participate in the sacrilege. You know, I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm just saying, if you know people that do that, please stop them if they are receiving Holy Communion not in a state of grace. So in once our trespasses have been absolved, we can approach the altar. Then the priest takes that paten again, symbolizing a soul. That's the gold paten symbolizing a soul in the state of grace. The deacon or at a low mass, the priest, will wipe that patent, again, showing that we need to be purified before we receive our Lord. And then he places the host on that patent. It's only after that preparation. Our sins have been forgiven. Dimita nobis debita nostra. That's when the subdeacon approaches. The soul wiped, wiped clean of sin. Then it can receive the host. That's what's going on at Holy Mass. There is a reason for everything at Holy Mass. Hmm. Okay. So, let's see. Is it okay to receive the Holy Eucharist on the tongue in the Novus Ordo even if the priest puts hand sanitizer on his hands before dispensing to the parish? I really struggle with this. Well, of course, only receive Holy Communion on the tongue. That's what I would say to you. Only receive Holy Communion on the tongue. Um, I think the possibility of getting a little hand, a little Purell in your mouth or whatever, I think that's worth receiving our blessed Lord, you know. The, the chance to receive our blessed Lord, even if that's the way the priest is giving him, okay, you know, fine, I, I'd rather receive our Lord. You can put all the Purell you want, well, not all, the, but, you know, receive our blessed Lord, you know, receive on the tongue, and, um, okay, if he's using hand sanitizer, that's... That's his uh, modus operandi, but, you know, 
receive on the tongue for sure. And uh, I, I wouldn't lose out on the chance. I mean, if I had to contend with that, I, I would still receive our blessed Lord just to have our Lord in your, in your soul, you know. So, um, good. Okay, let's see. Um, I think we just have time for maybe one more question or so. Um, <clears throat> Dear Father, uh, my husband and I feel called to move out west and attend your Latin Mass. How do we discern God's will or our own wants? We prayed about it for years and once moved out there to try the area. He got a job right away, but we couldn't find housing, so we left. We feel called there, but we fear the housing situation. So, um, yes, I understand that uh, Coeur d'Alene is nationally ranked as the fourth most. There have been more housing built in Coeur d'Alene is the f ranked fourth in the country for most housing built recent. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy to get housing out here. So one of the ways that God's will is discerned, of course, is by some of the circumstances around you. Don't just think, well, I need to go to this parish and so God will make it happen. Uh, something I always ask people, do you have a job? <laughs> Are you sure you got a job? Don't, you know, tempt God by just saying, well, I'm just going to drop everything and a job will show up. Um, I mean, there's some people that are really entrepreneurs, and they can they can do that. They know how to do that kind of thing, and it's it's going to be no problem for them to just just get going for themselves. But um, but I wouldn't tempt God if you don't have a good job situation lined up. However, you actually line that up, and then of course housing situation that's important too. Uh, I guess you just have to ask yourself is is this going to be the right thing for my soul and is this going to be prudent? God is not going to ask us to do something that's not prudent. So I would not throw caution to the wind to get something like this. You want to be at a, a good parish or whatnot. I wouldn't throw caution to the wind to do this, but you know, uh, pray and, and see that things are actually prudent. Make sure it's a prudent decision, that things do line up, that yes, there is a housing. I have found a house and it's affordable and I'm not going to go into bankruptcy because I've got this house and I have a job, I landed a job out there, those types of things. Those are signs that it is God's will if you, those things fall into place. If they don't fall into place, I, I would not throw caution to the wind and just, well, I'm just going to move out there anyway and God will make it work. That's tempting God, you know. So um, outside of that, there's probably so many variables that it would be hard to answer uh, even more accurately than that. So... Um, uh, a comment to, so uh, someone mentioned a comment, the vestments used to be conical, so if the priest put his arms down, uh, he couldn't lift them. It wasn't because the vestment was heavy. Um, I've actually worn conical vestments like you're talking about, and I've, I've consecrated as a priest using those conical vestments. And it, it is possible, the, the lifting of the back doesn't actually help anything with what you really need help with. What they actually should do with those conical vestments is lift from the front, to be honest, because the conical vestments actually, at the elevation, so I've, I've worn them, I know the ones you're talking about, they're really long and very long, they kind of get in the way. As you bring your arms down, they all kind of, they, they can tend to land in a heap on the, on the altar, so you have to be very careful because if you're elevating the chalice, the sacred host is there and you don't want the vestments to just land on the sacred host. So if anything, it's they should elevate the front. So it, um, uh, that's kind of the uh, that's one of the things with regards to those vestments. So, all right. Well, uh, we are we are out of time. I hope you join us for our next class. Um, uh, we will not be live streaming on January sixth because that is the feast of the Epiphany, and so we will not be having a Bible study that night. And uh, so want to. Uh, keep on uh, persevering. We'll continue with the next uh, uh, chapter, but also finish 19. And I uh, hope you uh, learned something tonight. Let's go ahead and end with a prayer, and I'll give you a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady's Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et fili et spiritus sancti, descendat super vos emaniat semper. Amen. God bless.